Hello, I'm Kathleen Owens, and I'm with the Diversity Learning Center here at Grand Rapids Community College. And this afternoon, I have the pleasure of speaking with Lisa Shannon. She is our final speaker for this year's Diversity Lecture Series. She's the author of A Thousand Sisters, and um, that subtitle is My Journey into the Worst Place on Earth to Be a Woman. And we're going to speak with Lisa about her travels to Congo and her work and her relationship with Congolese women. So nice to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Just delighted to be here. And I guess we'll start kind of at the beginning. So sure. how did this relationship with the Congolese women begin for you? Well, uh, uh, really, it began as a blank slate. I, I could not have picked Congo out on a map. I had no idea there was a war happening there. But um, I was home one day uh, sick with strep throat and saw an episode of Oprah. It was a 20-minute segment uh, that talked about the war. And I think for me, I was shocked. One, the links to the Rwandan genocide, that effectively, though we often talk about the Rwandan genocide as having um, uh, ended in 94, mm -hmm. that in a lot of ways, that conflict just moved over the border into mm -hmm. Congo and has continued to play out. Um, but really, the thing that struck me was the scale of the suffering for Congolese people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, conservative estimates are that 5.4 million people have died in the conflict, meaning it's the deadliest war since World War II. Um, and for Congolese women, it's widely considered the worst sexual violence on the planet. Um, actually, up until about uh, a few months ago, I would have said that we know probably hundreds of thousands of women have been raped. In fact, there are new statistics that are going to be coming out next month uh, that indicate four women are raped in Congo every five minutes, mm -hmm. that it's more than 1,100 a day, and that the rape totals are more than three million. So the and those, scale. Those numbers are hard to comprehend. So They're hard to comprehend, but just to frame it up for you, uh, prior to these new statistics. It was already called a rape pandemic, um, uh, and now the estimates are 20 23 times higher than when they were, than when they were referring to it as a, okay. as a, as a pandemic. So, okay. so just to be clear, uh, it's absolutely off the charts. 400,000 women raped by strangers uh, in Congo every year. 400,000 a year. A year. Um, and, and those rates are twice as much in war-affected provinces, although it's spread countrywide at this point, and that's mm -hmm. because, um, not to get too deep into policy too quickly, mm -hmm. but um, uh, that's because uh, the Congolese government um, is not effectively managing the security sector, as it's called, mm -hmm. the army, the police, mm -hmm. and they're responsible for a lot of the atrocities all over the country. Mm -hmm. So just for me on a personal level, to get back to your question, um, I was just profoundly uncomfortable with the idea that Congolese people had sort of categorically been written off mm -hmm. by the international community, that um, people had been so hands-off. I mean, in 2005, no one was even talking about it. Mm -hmm. And that was the most haunting thing for me. So although I had never done any kind of organizing or fundraising or public speaking or anything like that, I just felt like I couldn't let it go. So I decided I was going to do a run because that's what I could think of. I wish I had some sort were you of fancy... A runner, were you a runner already? Or did I, I, this was just a whole new experience from beginning to end? I was, a, let's say, a very casual runner. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, five miles was a long run for me at okay. the time, but I decided to train to run 30 miles, to trail run, uh, which is, in fact, a bit harder than running on flat streets, <laughs> um, with the idea that I would raise sponsorships for women mm -hmm. through Women for Women International, which is an amazing program where you can sponsor a woman to basically rebuild her life, go through a comprehensive education program, and exchange letters with her. So I thought, OK, who knows how to stop the deadliest war since World War II, but maybe we can try to make a difference in the lives of a few women and, mm -hmm. and let that be a, a starting place. So it was, a, it was the, uh, the opportunity not only to, it was the opportunity to have a relationship, yes. even if it's albeit by mail yeah. initially and to offer that opportunity for other women to have yep. that relationship with women in the Congo. Absolutely. I have actually grown to think that that is key. And it's one thing that has been lacking as we approach a lot of these situations, um, you know, genocide, mass atrocity, the way we relate to, say, poverty in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, that, to me, I've grown to feel that one of the biggest threats to human security is um, our well-trained capacity to flip off our empathy switch. Mm -hmm. um, that we can just shrug and say, well, that's too bad. 
but there's really nothing I can do. So if you can find a way to flip the empathy switch back on mm -hmm. and keep it on, which in, in my view you are able to do once you're relating to someone mm -hmm. like your friend, once you're relating to someone like your sister, we have a whole new sort of platform, a whole new, um, you know, basically approach that we can leverage then to affect policy and end the violence. So, so even though at the beginning it was what I could think of and it seemed simple right. and measurable, right. in fact, I feel like it has provided sort of endless soul, soul fuel uh, to, to continue So you work. had all these numbers and you have these statistics bouncing exactly. about in your head and that's sort of what triggered the interest was just mm -hmm. the enormity of the numbers. So you started the run mm -hmm. and then you sort of hooked up with Women's for Women International right. yeah. and then you went to the Congo. Yeah. And I, can you describe what you expected to find and mm -hmm. what you did find? Well, uh, in a <laughs> yeah, there were, certain, there were certain things I certainly expected. I mean, in many ways, it was a blank slate. Because to be clear, I had never been to Africa before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd definitely never been to a war zone, so to speak. So I didn't know what to expect. I think in some ways, when we think of places like Congo, you imagine sort of like decrepit idea, uh, in a, in a refugee camps with smoke rising and starving people. Yeah. So one of the biggest surprises going into Congo is just how beautiful it is. I mean, it's absolutely lush, rolling hills, gorgeous countryside, beautiful people. Um, certainly there were security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it was disorienting for me, so mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you you know, I, I've spent a total of about four months on the ground in Congo between my three trips. And even now, I couldn't tell you what moments were dangerous or weren't. Right. Um, I mean, there are some. I, <laughs> I have some indicator of that. But, but um, I think the biggest surprise for me going in had been that many people had described Congolese women in a very particular way. People had talked about Congolese women as victims. They had talked about them as... Um, having an, a look of utter death in their eyes, mm -hmm. um, that basically they, they had effectively been killed mm -hmm. um, through, through uh, what they'd lived through. And that so you weren't expecting any warmth, any, any warmth or joy? Or, <laughs> no, uh, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, I was expecting a lot of heaviness and, um, and um, a lot of people who had sort of checked out because of the trauma. Mm -hmm. And what was surprising to me is that in every women's group, I was just greeted with unbelievable singing and dancing and celebrations. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, one of the first words I actually learned in Swahili was uh, faraha, which means joy. Mm -hmm. um, because women would just say that over and over again, I am so happy. Um, so that was a shock to me. And I, I walked away with an awful lot of questions that I certainly tried to explore in the book about how that can be. How mm -hmm. it can be that in a place like Congo, you know, where people have lived through trauma that is designed to destroy the human spirit. Mm -hmm. You can still have joy in a way that I have actually never experienced here. Um, so there was an irony in that for me that, that, that I had a good life, you know, by most standards uh, mm -hmm. before getting involved with this, but that I have in fact never been so happy as being in Congo, connecting with Congolese women, seeing them and their sort of resilient spirit and experiencing what it means to be connected mm -hmm. to another human being you, that, that you don't owe anything to, that there's no reason you should be connected, and yet you are, right? Yeah. So, so to me, that was striking, and it's something that I, I continue to think about a lot. And Do you feel a, a bit not at home now when you're not in the Congo? Does Congo become another home for you? Ooh. <laughs> The truth is, um, it's gotten harder. I, you know, on my most recent trip, I remember the morning before I left, I sat down and cried because I didn't want to come home. Mm -hmm. I know my role is here, and I know that I can have the biggest impact here. Um, I am very connected to people here, uh, and I love our culture for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yet, you know, there, there is something um, in Congo, 
you know, Zainab Salbi, the founder of Women for mm -hmm. Women, uh, says that it's her favorite place on the planet because you have the worst of humanity, but you also have the best of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think for anyone who has spent time in conflict zones and knows what it means to connect with other people mm -hmm. on that level, it's hard to come back here and see a heavy focus on things that seem trivial. Mm -hmm. So I don't think Congolese people would in any way fault us for our homes and our families and mm -hmm. having a full life here because that's what they value too. But when one starts fussing over BMWs and iPods and you know that kind of thing, then I have a harder time with that. So it was, to be frank, a rough adjustment on the most, the most recent trip I would trip imagine home. that transition must be shocking. I had to move, it was funny, I had to move when I came home and I was so annoyed at the thought I would actually have to invest in like looking on Craigslist and trying to figure all of that out that I just moved all my stuff into my mom's garage and just didn't have a place to live <laughs> for two mm -hmm. months because I couldn't deal with it. To me it mm -hmm. seemed so mundane to have to think about something like right. that. I mean, I'm hopefully more adjusted than that now, but, uh, but you have those moments where like if, uh, if people want to enter into squabbles over little things like light bulbs or dust bunnies, it's just yeah. like... Do you feel <laughs> that in some ways your patience is greater and smaller? Yes, I think you're exactly right. Okay. You're exactly right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know that they sing a song about you, um, which with the line that is, um, you are a child of the Congo. Yeah, hey, Lisa, stay with us. You are a child yeah. of Congo now. Yeah, yeah they, I heard that in several locations in Congo. I think it's a standard song. It's probably something they sing... To guess, I don't know. You know I don't know, okay. but I know that I heard it several times when I was there. So that must be um, amazing to have that kind of trust given to you by them as well. Yeah. I mean, they trust in you. Yeah, I think that's true. It, it was surprising. I yeah. think when you when you talk again about expectations going in, mm -hmm. um, I think I was expecting a level of awkwardness and suspicion. Yeah. And for the women that we had supported through Women for Women, that just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And you would think, see, this is another one of the surprises. I thought for sure it would be about the money. I thought the money would be the important part. Mm -hmm. um, because when you talk about writing a letter to someone who has had their home burned and their family killed in front of them, mm -hmm. gang raped in front of their children, um, what, what could you, I say, what can you say in a letter right. that would mean anything? Right. And yet, when I got there, what I found was, you know, women carrying around letters from their sponsors like it was their most prized possession. Mm -hmm. You know, because someone knows me, someone knows I'm here in this in this place. Someone's paying attention. I think that is exactly it. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly it. Um, it was interesting. I had a conversation at one point. Um, with the literary great Margaret Atwood under oh, a strange, strange, strange did set you? of circumstances. Okay. But Alice yes. Walker and Margaret Atwood. Yeah, and Maya Angelou, too. Yeah. So I don't know how that happened. I mean, you know. A triumvirate. Case, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, but one thing that when we were talking about Congo, she brought up was the work of a particular psychologist whose name escapes me right now looking at childhood trauma mm -hmm. and the idea that um, you can actually construct a sociopathic personality by raising a child surrounded by violence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the one thing that you can do to interrupt that cycle is have one outside adult just communicate with that child that this is not who they are and that this is not normal and that that seems to be enough mm. to disrupt that cycle. And so when she said that, I thought, wow, that's interesting because in some ways on some small scale, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just saying, we're being that outside person, communicating with someone that this set of circumstances is not normal, mm -hmm. but they're good and mm -hmm. whole, and, and we love them. Mm -hmm. So that it seems to serve some sort of unique function mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't understand before I went to Congo. Mm -hmm. So now, I, and, and I understand now you're moving sort of like, that's the relational individual mm -hmm. trying to help individuals, in some cases, villages and yeah. communities yeah. Um, individually. And now you're kind of, which is sort of the, I, I guess dealing sometimes with the symptoms or the consequences of mm -hmm. the war as opposed to maybe sure. the reasons behind the war. Right. And you're starting to work a little bit more on addressing some policies and right. why is it happening? What kind of, why is the war right. there and why is it continuing? Well, I saw a documentary recently that influenced my thinking on this quite a bit called Worse Than War. It covered the history of genocide basically since World War II. And the guy who made the documentary made a pretty basic argument. He said, if you want to stop Genocide and mass atrocity, you have to do two things. One, 
You have to relate to it like it's happening to your own family. Mm. So we've been doing that. Mm -hmm. But the second thing that you have to do is change the cost benefit for the people who are perpetrating mm -hmm. it. So genocide and mass atrocity is a calculated decision. Someone has decided it pays them more to rape in mass, to kill people 500 at a time, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and that it's worth it, that there will not be repercussions for that. So at its essence, what you need to look at is changing the cost benefit. And so there are a lot of very concrete ways that the US specifically could be playing a much more active role. Uh, the US gives Congo about a billion dollars a year, and yet, we ask very little of the Congolese government in exchange. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I mentioned before, the Congolese army, the Congolese police, uh, in many ways are public enemy number one. I mean, they're raping, um, murdering, uh, often they function as paid assassins. Um, so, so the Congolese- So it's hard to tell when you're there who's who. I right? think you're I pretty mean, safe to say any guy wandering around with a gun in Congo is someone not, that not should give you pause. Right. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, but I think that, uh, so several things. One, you have to look at the economic drivers of the conflict. Congo is widely considered one of the wealthiest countries on the planet in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, uh, gold, uh, diamonds, uh, you have tin, tantalum, and uh, tungsten, which are in all of our consumer electronics mm -hmm. products called mm -hmm. conflict minerals. Right. Um, so inadvertently, we're all sort of helping fund the war. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of economic drivers have uh, resulted in basically malicious controlling mines, and then funneling those goods out through countries like Rwanda and Uganda. Rwanda and Uganda have made an enormous amount of money off of this conflict. And yet we maintain very positive relationships yes. with both of those governments as well as the Rwanda Congolese government. Rwanda is often held up as having made some huge strides. And, well, and you know what? Rwanda has made huge strides mm -hmm. internally. Mm -hmm. But the impact that Rwanda's policies have had on Congo have been devastating. And in fact, a recent report by the UN, uh, a mapping report that came out in the fall, indicates that in fact Rwanda was behind what was termed at one point when the report came out, then they went back and changed it, genocide against Hutu refugees who were in Congo at the mm -hmm. time. So while it's OK for Rwanda to um, have concerns about security threats related to former genocidier attacking Rwanda or wanting to take over, you can't enter another country and kill innocent civilians because of based on their ethnic group. Right. That's genocide. Right. And it happened. Tens of, tens of thousands of people were killed in Congo in 1996. So Rwanda has continued to play a very active role um, supporting militias. Uh, those militias now, many of them have been integrated into the Congolese army. So we have some so, sphere of influence that we could start influencing absolutely, absolutely. those that we have good relationships right. with to impact yeah. Congo. And so specifically, a special envoy. What you have is a lot of interest on the part of the international community that isn't coordinated. And it's also not coordinated within the US government. Mm -hmm. So a special envoy would, would serve internally in the US uh, the purpose of coordinating US efforts while spearheading an international effort to pressure the Congolese government to step it up and basically make aid conditional on, the, on, mm -hmm. on, on true engagement on the part of the Congolese government. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, specifics would be dealing with minerals, security sector reform, making sure that their soldiers, you know, basically uh, protect and serve rather than steal and rape, prosecute, right. prosecute uh, mm -hmm. criminals. So for instance, one thing that we're working on in a policy paper right now uh, is just a basic statement that the US should not provide aid to um, military units where their commanders are known for mass atrocities. That sounds pretty it basic does. to me. It does. You know? um, another example uh, is that the US uh, recently gave $17 million towards rape treatment in Congo, which is very important and great. However, um, there is a UN program uh, aimed at demobilizing combatants that has an $8 million shortfall that would help demobilize 8,000 combatants. Now, my question is, who's looking at that? Mm -hmm. 17 million for rape treatment versus mm -hmm. 8 million to demobilize 8,000 combatants. Mm -hmm. We need to think about the highest and best use of our funds and what is actually going mm -hmm. to protect Congolese people. So that's, those are all important questions. There's goodwill on the part of the State Department. Mm -hmm. um, but they're frankly not stepping it up, and it's not acceptable. You know, we, we can't engage in more sort of grandiose statements about grave concern while we, we're, mm -hmm. yeah. we're not even giving the basics in terms of coordinating our own efforts right. or pressuring the Congolese government in any way. Mm -hmm.
So do you see your next step then as um, organizing anew? I mean, and having these yeah. two parallel tracks running. And, and yeah. I know that you're not, you know, as intimately involved in the logistics and everything around Run for Congo right. anymore. Right. Um, although, clearly, it's still your oh, yeah. baby. Yes. <laughs> um, so do you see yourself now moving into some, th it, it, in keeping those parallel tracks going? Absolutely. So you're making the human relationship connections, but now also talking about yeah. actually curing the problem. Exactly. I mean, are we dealing with some sort of... Change. Yeah, that is actually exactly what I'm working on. We're in the process of forming a new organization called A Thousand Sisters, okay. um, which Tricky. is geared towards <laughs> uh, getting people to commit to do two things once a month. Do something to relate to Congolese people like they're your family. That could be sponsoring, that could be running, it could be praying, it could be whatever is personal to you. But okay. Relate to Congolese people like family. And then do one thing to change the cost benefit for perpetrators. So policy, one personal, one policy action once a month. And that policy might be boycotting something or sure. not choosing to buy something. Or, exactly. I boycott or asking questions. Yeah, I boycott conflict minerals, uh, so I only buy used tech products. Okay. Um, uh, that's one thing that people can do. Uh, contacting our, you know, our representatives, certainly letting Secretary of State Hillary Clinton know that we'd like to see more, President Obama. Um, we, we change it every month, um, but we're, gonna, mm. we're updating our website right now, so it's becoming a .org rather than a .com, which okay. was the book website. Okay. And then on Facebook, we're really active on Facebook. And we've done quite a lot already. I mean, just in December, uh, my mom and I and a group of women went and camped out in front of the State Department in seven degree wind chill for a week, encouraging a plan. Right. What we're asking. Did anyone come and talk with you? Were you able to? In have fact, an we did. We we were able to um, meet with Assistant Secretary Carson. Okay. Um, and we were right under Secretary Clinton's window, and were informed that she was well aware of our presence through the week. <laughs> um, we've requested a meeting with her, uh, and hope that she'll decide to do that. Um, because we feel like it's important. It's a priority to mm -hmm. American women. Um, to see real change, we're really not satisfied with, with, with grand statements. We'd like to actually see action. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, you know, we're going to continue to push that way. And so we change the ask every month, whatever, wherever we are in terms of policy. Um, and we'll be updating people through Facebook and also through our website about what, that, what we're asking people to do. I think that's brilliant. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you. Especially <laughs> the changing, I mean, that's brilliant. So it's not automatic pilot ever. No. You always are thinking. You always are having to make a choice to do something new each month. That's yeah. That's a or, or look yeah. at something new. Well, yeah. and not only that, but you know, one of the things that we've been looking at closely is that there are a lot of campaigns that are based on people doing a teeny tiny little bit every mm -hmm. month, like cut and paste an email and right. or something. We're asking for more than that. Mm -hmm. um, we want people's actions to be informed by something personal. We think each activist matters, and that if, even if people write a two-line personal message mm -hmm. to Secretary Clinton, that means more than a cut-and-paste email. Right. And so uh, we have done that, where um, I'll post a letter on my blog, and then everybody will post their own letter, and we've gotten hundreds of letters in support. Mm -hmm. um, or when we did our, uh, our camp out uh, in front of the State Department, we did an online companion, which we called Outcry for Congo, where we asked people to take photos of themselves holding a sign to Secretary Clinton, okay. Texas for Congo, or Congo Plan Now, or whatever mm -hmm. people's message was. And in fact, uh, uh, at the State Department, people were briefed all the way up to Secretary Clinton on that action. But what we heard from the State Department is that it meant a lot to them that it was just regular, everyday people mm -hmm. showing up in a personal way. Mm -hmm. So we try to emphasize people feel showing like up in a personal way. You feel like way. you're finding new advocates, new activists, that you've you found a new demographic. People yeah. who have been wanting to do something and have perhaps been overwhelmed by the enormity of choices that you could make to Absolutely. deal with issues around the world. Absolutely, because I think all of us when we're young imagine that we are going to grow up to be someone who will do something big on the planet. Mm -hmm. But sometimes life takes over. Maybe it's students in their classes. Right. Maybe it's you know a mom having kids and holding down the fort or your career. Um, but it's always there, and I think that's one thing I've learned through my journey, because I think I used to be one of those people and went through kind of like a lapse for you know, 10 or 12 years, and kind of I felt like in some ways forgot who I was. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned is that it's always right there, and all it takes is just showing up in right. some simple way. Absolutely. And, and you, be, you, you quickly discover that you're a person you didn't know you were. Right. And every single one of us has that power. Um, so it can be as simple as just writing a two-line message, mm -hmm. but, it, but you wrote that message. That's your voice, uh, and it matters. So before we end this afternoon, then, um, 
you have some local connections here in Grand Rapids, right? Yes. In fact, I had a lovely lunch with a, a woman named Lisa Boyd today who has done Run for Congo Women in Chicago. I met her there, and now she's putting together a run here okay. in Grand Rapids. Um, and she's been very involved. She's a military wife. She's a member of a church here, and she's been very involved in reaching out to her community and is interested in playing more of a leadership role, uh, talking to the government as well. I'll tell you, it's real. I love it when I can sit down and talk with someone who's never done any quote-unquote activism before mm -hmm. and as she said today at lunch I don't know how to talk to the government and yet when we talked about certain things she didn't have any problem breaking it down into like mom terms right mm -hmm. so she was like well here's what I say to my you know 21 year old son it's quid pro quo if I'm gonna do something for you I need <laughs> right. to get something in exchange so she didn't have any trouble mm -hmm. breaking down the kind of relationship that right. the U.S. government needs to develop with the Congolese government so in it partnership. So it helps to learn that you don't have to know it all. You do not you have, have to, to know, know the whole political system to make a difference. No, and I think I think it's almost more powerful mm -hmm. when it's just everyday people kind of processing the information and then feeding it back to our government. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, wait, if I can strike the right balance with my mm -hmm. teenage son, <laughs> right. you know, right. and learn how to can, manage that, that happen, you know, right. perhaps that could inform our foreign <laughs> policy. Not that we want to take on a parental sort of no. approach, certainly not, but it's not unreasonable to have expectations. Right. If we're going to give people a lot right. of money, they need to step up, and that's healthy for everyone right. involved. Right. So. Right. No, that's okay. That's fantastic. Yeah. So let me see if I've got it before we finish. Sure. So that is going to be a thousand sisters org soon, but it's soon. Dot it's dot com, com right now. now. And, and then there's Women from International, and that's yeah. the organization that actually uh, distributes money yes. and connects people together, women to women together, yes. and women are trained then in the Congo or given what they need to be trained yes. um, to have their own businesses or support their families. Yes. And then Run for Congo um, is also another Mm -hmm. Is that under Women for International now? Do yeah, we find it's that, managed would by... Would they find that in the same place? Yeah, or? it's okay. managed by uh, Women for Women International, but on the new uh, uh, thousandsisters.org site, we are going to have a list of actions that will okay. include links to Women for Women, Run for Congo Women, other suggestions of what you could do on a personal level, and then a list of things you can do on a policy level and then an action of the month. So it'll be all basically on one page, very easy to find. Well, I believe in West Michigan and Grand Rapids that we're ready for this. That, I, I believe you that are, you too. Will find some champions and some new friends and some new sisters. Absolutely. And we really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah.